We're going to be talking again today about the New Testament text, how good are the texts. And the reason why we've been going through this series on how we got our Bibles is so that we can be assured that when, if and when, and it may very well happen, our lives are on the line, our faith is on the line, we will know that the book we have in our hands is something we can rely upon. So it's a really important thing to understand that the Bible that we have in our hands is something that we can say is the Word of God. More about that next Shabbat. As far as how it came to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we're going to get into that. But today we're going to look at 5b, how good are the texts? We started that last Shabbat. Can everybody see this okay? Last Shabbat, we looked at the Tanakh. Well, actually, it was the previous Shabbat before that. Looked at the Tanakh and its evidence that points to its accuracy as our scriptural text today. We saw how it was transmitted, how it was copied by a scribe, how precisely that was, because every single letter was counted. And if the count were invalid, if they didn't have exactly the quantity of letters, then that scroll was not valid. One too many letter, the scroll was not valid. It would be destroyed. One too few letters, the scroll was not valid. It would be destroyed. So what we've got here is we've got somebody known as a scribe or so far that would go ahead and take from a copy that was already in existence and then write meticulously every single one of these letters. 47 lines per page. And so what we see here is how was it that the what we call the Older Testament transmitted to us? And it was done in a very specific way. We do have these things, I do believe, up on the uh, website, our congregation website, if you want to go over this. So last Shabbat, we were looking at the Brit Hadashah and how it was transmitted to us. The Brit Hadashah, Brit means covenant, Dasha means new or newer. We could call them the apostolic writings, or we could call them the New or the Newer Testament writings. From last Shabbat, we noted that the method of transmission were that when letters were sent to various congregations, as for example, the Romans, the Corinthians, the Ephesians, the Philippians, the Colossians, the Thessalonians, as letters were sent to these congregations, they went ahead and made copies of them. Now this is very important. While there may be few copies, relatively speaking, for the same time period of the Tanakh, the Older Covenant, why were there fewer covet, uh, copies of that? Because when a scroll got too old to be able to read legibly, then that scroll was buried just as a human being would be. Hence, you will not find it on the surface of the earth walking around. It wouldn't be in a synagogue being used. It would be buried. So that would be one less scroll that is in existence today for people to be able to use. So in the transmission of the Tanakh, first of all, there were fewer copies because simply a sofer, one who has been trained in that, and there were relatively few people that were trained in that art, would make a copy precisely to the very letter. And then, of course, when it got so old that it couldn't be used anymore, it was buried. So fewer um, scrolls exist. Now, the neat thing was, as we talked about, that the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls helped us a lot. The Dead Sea Scrolls that were written in Hebrew, and there were other manuscripts written in Greek and Aramaic, they were evidence that the Tanakh that we have today in our hands, in the original language, is exactly what we would have seen back in the first century, in fact, even before that. So while there would be relatively few copies of the Torah scroll in existence, there were many copies of the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant. And the reason why is because letters coming from an apostle or for someone associated with an apostle would go to that church, go into the hands of one of the elders, and the elder would go ahead and pass out a sheet so other people could make copies. So you had people within the congregation making copies 
of the letter that was sent to that particular church. So they were collected by the various churches. Now, Norm Geisler, in his book, General Introduction to the Bible, page 277, writes this. The initial reason for collecting and preserving the inspired books was that they were prophetic. We're talking about the Tanakh, and we're even talking about the New Testament. That is, since they were written by an apostle or a prophet of God, that's the entire scripture, they were considered valuable to the churches that received them. And if they were valuable in the minds of the church people, they should be preserved. Now this reasoning, according to Geisler, is apparent in apostolic times by the collection and circulation of Paul's epistles. You can see that in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, and in Colossians 4, 16. So they were sent to the church, this church received them, and the church made multiple copies. Now all the churches didn't put them all together in such a form that we have today, where we have Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and we have all the writings. Each of these churches held on to them for a while. Then eventually, as these churches grew larger, they began to share amongst themselves. So the writings of the apostles were preserved by these churches. In other words, only if an author's letter was considered authoritative, in other words, that it had, uh, it speaks into the lives of the people within that church, were they even collected by the recipient churches. And then they would be copied and distributed among the brethren within that recipient congregation. If they were not considered authoritative, and if they were not considered apostolic, or somebody associated with an apostle, they would do as I did. I've had uh, quite a number of prophets that came to me in the past and send me letters. And what I did with those letters from those apostles or prophets is see that big uh, plastic um, trash can over there? Circular filed them. They went into the circular file. They were not prophetic writings from a prophet or an apostle, even though they claimed to be. Briefly, I would almost imagine you could say that false prophets and false apostles are a dime a dozen. Quantitatively, I've had, over the years, many apostles and prophets come to me, and they want to speak to the congregation. They want to tell them the message that came from God. You know why you don't get to hear them? It's because I don't let them speak. And the reason why is because I have to test whatever they are going to say, and I want to know what they're going to say. I have to test it with what is already revealed in the Bible, as did the Bereans test Paul. So if Paul's writings were not considered authoritative by the recipient church, it would not have been copied and distributed amongst those within that church. So why were the writings preserved? It's because they felt they believed that this came from an apostle of God and spoke into their lives. And that's why they were produced, reproduced, and distributed to as many copies of that letter to the congregants. Now today, in some countries that are really short of Bibles, they don't have a lot of Bibles, whenever somebody gets a Bible, those pages are carefully cut out and passed amongst the congregation so they can be copied. So today, in locations where Bibles are very scarce, they do the same thing as the recipient churches were doing back in the first century. They were making copies so everybody could have a copy of that Bible. And that's what was going on. Now today, we're moving on from that point, and we're going to examine the test of a historical document. This book, in our hands, is a historical document, as well as being many, many other things. So there was a time when archaeology and science said that there were no uh, Hittites. The Bible must have been mistaken in saying that there were Hittites, but later on archaeology proved there were Hittites. So what is necessary and what's being done by a lot of archaeologists today are they're taking the Bible, they're reading the Bible, and they're using the Bible to help them find where some of these cities and some of these events happened. So the Bible is an archaeological document and scientific document, if you will. 
where archaeologists are using it to find sites. Now, since it's a historical document, the historical reliability of the scripture should be tested by the same criteria as Homer and the Iliad and all the other ancient documents. Now, anybody know what went on? Let's see, what is... If you ever watched Back to the Future and Marty came uh, forward from the past some 30 some years to what day was that this month? October 20. October what? October 21. 21? 21. October 21, 2015. That was programmed into that DeLorean's computer, if you ever watched Back to the Future. Now, let me just imagine. Let me just go ahead and say, what if I were writing the book on October 21st and putting it back into the context of Back to the Future, the movie, and I was the one that was writing the video, you know, the script for the movie. What would be a giveaway, this is going to strain some brains, but what would be a giveaway that I'm writing that particular thing today instead of 30 years ago? What? The culture and what was going on. Okay, the culture and what's going on. Somebody else. In the case of Obama's birth certificate, it was the wrong name of the hospital. Ah, yes! That's a good one. Obama's birth certificate is a good one. The one at least he produced. Yeah. Do you know why? Because on his birth certificate, which was back in the 1960s, it says he was born of an African-American. Guess what? They didn't use that term back then. So in the same way, that's an anachronism. Something came out. Wait a minute. That doesn't fit. So a test of the historical document. Let's do the same thing with the Bible. There are some people that say that the book of Daniel toward the end on the prophetic visions and stuff from the nations that actually came in and defeated Israel that the prophet Gabriel gave to Daniel as an interpretation. They say that had to have been written after the event. Not in a prophetic sense looking ahead. Now, the reason why they say it is that level of accuracy could not happen unless whoever was writing it was looking backward. Now, I'll tell you something really interesting. 30 years ago, when Back to the Future was written and shown, they, Nike had tennis shoes that self-laced. And they had a hoverboard that, of course, that Michael J. Fox, who's the character of Abner, uh, was riding. Tell me, on October 21st of this year, how many of you have Nike tennis shoes that self-laced? How many of you have one of those hoverboards? You see what it is? It's a test of a document. Simple. If there is an anachronism, if there is a saying, if there is a phrase, if there is something that lends you to the thought that this was written after the event, we can see that within the writings. Now, I happen to know, watching the movie Back to the Future, which I really liked when I was younger, I happen to know that one of those things they predicted was going to happen didn't. So what we've got here are tests of any document. So, for instance, if there is a biblical doc document that goes ahead and has many anachronisms within it, things out of their time frame, we should be able to see that within the document. But before we even do this, we have to go ahead and assume something first. The assumption is, and I'm going to come back to that, that the document that we come across has to have an assumption, first of all, of being accurate and true. We don't go into a document historically and assume it isn't. We have to go further. We have to go into more depth than that. We have to put it through the test. Once we put it through the test, then we go ahead and say, no, that's not true. Now, last Shabbat, I think, or the Shabbat before, I was talking about the Gospel of Thomas. Anybody remember that? Why was it that the Gospel of one of the 
prima facie on the face of things, why was it that the Gospel of Thomas was rejected even by the early church? Why? Even though it's found in the Nag Hammadi, the Egypt site, it was determined by the very few in the very beginning, by the church leaders, that this could not possibly have been written by the Apostle Thomas. Later on, as we get into dating uh, scrolls or documents and stuff like that, it is shown that the Gospel of Thomas was written about 140 to 160 AD. Unless Thomas is really a long liver, he wasn't around then to write that gospel, you see. But there were internal ways to check that as well to see this cannot possibly be the gospel of Thomas. Content. Content. You have to go into the content of the document to be able to see these things. That's where this is important, the test of a historical document. There are ways to test it, and we need to make sure that they were tested that way. Three basic principles of testing the document for history. First, the bibliographical test. Second, the internal evidence test. And finally, is there any external evidence that proves the gospel, or that the document is accurate and true? Number one, the bibliographical text is an examination of the textual transmission by which documents reach us. In other words, since we don't have the original autograph, none of us do, there is no autograph of the New Testament writing, any book, none. All we have is fragments. And there was a complete document and I can't remember off the top of my head which one it was, <laughs> but there was a complete document, but nevertheless, the question is, since we don't have the original documents, how can we put together what that original might have looked like with accuracy? Next, we need to know how many manuscripts and what was the time interval between the original and the extent or currently existing copies. We need to know all those things. Now, unless you're a Bible college student and stuff, a lot of times you don't even get this stuff in church. You don't get this you know, anywhere. I hate to do this to you, but you've got to know it. At least have an idea of how did we get it. So the question is, the number of manuscripts that are extant right now, and how close were they to the original based on date? A man or scholar named F.E. Peter stated, on the basis of manuscript tradition alone, the works that made up the Christian New Testament were the most frequently copied and widely circulated books of antiquities. Why is this? Well, I already talked about that. The churches regarded them as authoritative in their lives. Hence, copies were made. As many copies as possible. How many of you have a copy of a Bible in your hand? Well, thank you, Gutenberg. You gave us the ability to mass produce documents instead of have, having to handwrite every one of them. Speeds up the process, Soda, right? So, how many of you have a complete Jewish Bible? How many of you have a King James Bible? How many of you have a New International Bible? How many of you have the Oxford Bible? <laughs> I've got every one of them and more. Now, the reason why I have all these books is not because I want to fill up my shelves. Ask my wife, I've gotten rid of many books over many years. But one thing I'm not doing is getting rid of any of the copies of the Bible. Why do I want to have all these copies of the Bible? Because the complete Jewish Bible is not the most accurate translation, I'm going to tell you, not the most accurate translation of the Word of God. But neither is the King James. But neither is the New International. But neither is any of the translations. Bonnie Mills asked me some time, ago, some time ago, months ago, she said, what's the most accurate translation? You know what I said? None. None of them are the most accurate. None. Our problem when we start to get into doctrinal uh, differences and stuff usually come about as a result of translation. And there is an old saying from way back when, 
And I'm not patting myself on back. I just happen to be in the right spot at the right time. I took Russian in the seventh grade. I took Spanish in the eighth and ninth grade. I took German in the eleventh and twelfth grade. I took Hebrew and Greek in Bible college. I can tell you for a fact that that old saying, something was lost in the translation, is absolutely 100% correct. Always. So if you're familiar with other languages, you know the same thing. Nishvar? Isn't it so? Uh -huh. Swedish and German are very close. And so I learned German once upon a time. But they're not exactly because you take that literally, not so. You take that literally. I was asking Nishvar, is that not so? Is that what we say in English? No. We say, is this so? Is this true? We just turn words around. But that's a translation thing. A little one. But it makes all the difference in the world. Here's what we got to understand. The New Testament was the most frequently copied. Why? Because the churches regarded them as authoritative. They made copies so that who can have a Bible? Everyone. That's why you have a Bible here. Why? Because somebody felt it was important enough in our time and day that as many people that can get a Bible in their hands can get one. That was the purpose of Wycliffe Bible translators at one time. That was the purpose of other groups. They'd go into cultures that don't even have an alphabet. They'd produce an alphabet phonetically. And then they'd write copies of scripture based on that alphabet. Because they felt it was important enough and authoritative enough to spread the word to all the world. So we also have the manuscript evidence for superior New Testament reliability. Now, you could go to this site, and for all those that have given me your email address, if you haven't received the handout for this week, please give me, send me an email, and I'll send you the handout. Because if you go to this site right here, you're going to be able to go ahead and see um, what this information is by Matt Slick. He says the New Testament is constantly under attack, and it is, and its reliability and accuracy are often contested by critics, and they are. If the critics want to disregard the New Testament by based on just manuscript evidence alone, and the quantity of manuscripts there were, they must also disregard other ancient writings by Plato, Aristotle, and Homer. Because really, there are fewer copies of those ancient manuscripts than there are of the New Testament. You have more evidence supporting the New Testament than you do to support Plato, Homer, and Aristotle. The New Testament documents are better preserved and are more numerous than any other ancient writing. This stands to support the accuracy. Yes, Glenn. But you have a proof text to verify what the New Testament is saying by just going to the front of the book. And what was that? If you want to know what it says is true here, yeah. you just go farther to the front oh, yeah. of the book. That's what I'm saying. We have a proof text to check it with. And if it doesn't line up, there's something definitely wrong. Exactly. And by the way, this artificial distinction that's found in many Bibles, you see there's a page missing. I admire Dr. Stern for that. There's actually a page missing between the last book of the Tanakh, 2 Chronicles 36, and the first book of the Brief Hadashah. You know what page is missing? Some of you have that page in your Bible. The page that says New Testament. Because as Glenn was saying, what the New Testament is, is simply reiterating in a form that people can understand what was already revealed in the Tanakh. It's a midrash of the Torah. It's a midrash of the Torah. Yep. It's a digging deeper of what has already been revealed in the Tanakh. So it's very important for us to know that. Now today there are about 5,686 Greek manuscripts in existence for the New Testament. That's pretty good. 
If we were going to compare that number of New Testament manuscripts to other ancient writings, we'll find that the New Testament manuscripts far outweigh the others in quantity. There are thousands more New Testament manuscripts in Greek than in any other ancient writing. So that produces an internal consistency. Wherever you find fragments of the New Testament, you will see that no matter what the, uh, the age of that document is, there's about a 99.5% textually pure accuracy between these documents. There are a few things that are um, inserted in the New Testament writings. I talked about that briefly last Shabbat. If you go to the Gospel of Mark, and you look at the very last chapter of Mark, you're going to find where it says in Mark chapter 16 that um, at least you've got an uh, honest person in Dr. Stern who says verses 9 through 20 are found in many ancient Greek manuscripts, but not in the two oldest ones. Important to know that came in later. In addition, there are over 19,000 copies in the Syriac, Latin, Coptic, and the Aramaic language. In other words, the total supporting New Testament manuscript base is over 24,000. That's pretty good. Now let's look at the internal evidence test. As I said earlier, you need to give the benefit of the doubt to the document at first. We don't go into a document thinking it's got to be a fraud. We don't go into the document thinking, oh, you know, there's something wrong with it. Now, why is it that First and Second Maccabees are not found in the Jewish Bible as the canonized Bible or in the Protestant Bible? It is found in the Catholic. They are found in the Catholic Bible. Why not in the Jewish one? It is a Jewish work. Why wasn't it there? God's name is not mentioned. Pardon? God's name is not mentioned. Well, God is not mentioned. that's Esther. Esther. Right? That's Esther. What, Ruth? No. Uh, Esther. I was saying Maccabees. Yep. <laughs> it's because they were not considered to be inspired or prophetic. It is a good historical document. Yes. When I go into, you know, when we come up to Hanukkah coming up, what documents do I need to go to? Maccabees, first and second Maccabees, to understand what is the reason for the season. But as far as being canon, only the Catholic Church holds it to be canon. The book of Daniel has all to do with Hanukkah too. Yes, it does. Now, Daniel isn't totally written in Hebrew. Daniel, toward in different parts, are written in Aramaic. So it caused some consternation amongst scholars. But it's really important for us to look at the internal evidence. John Warwick Montgomery, a very intelligent Bible scholar, writes that literary critics still follow Aristotle's dictum that the benefit of the doubt is to be given to the document itself, not arrogated by the critic to himself. In other words, if we see a book in the Bible, it is not our job to remove it. It is not your or my job to remove it. You are arrogating yourself, putting yourself in the position above that. Now, does that mean the Bible can't stand criticism? No. If it is the word of God, then truly, does God have anything to fear? No, not at all. So we have to realize that when God writes something to us, he is writing something to us and giving it to us through either a prophet in the Tanakh or a prophet slash apostle or one associated with an apostle in the Breed Hadashah. So, he goes on to say, one must listen to the claims of the document under analysis. In other words, we don't assume that it's fraudulent. We look at the document, take it as its face value initially. We look at that. We don't assume fraud or error unless the author himself disqualifies himself. How could he do that? He could do it by contradicting himself within the document or contradicting other Bible 
books or chapters, or he has factual inaccuracies. Afro-American. Pardon? Afro-American. Africa, yep, African-American, yep. I have great suspicions about that birth certificate because that's not the only thing that has problems. The name of the hospital has problems. That didn't exist by that name back in the 60s. Oh, there are a lot of problems. But is that going to stop? Is that going to cause Congress to remove him? If it would have, it would have already happened. Don't worry about it. They changed the law, so it's all okay now. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So my point being is you look at the document, you accept it, and then you test it out. There are ways to test it out to look at it to see. Now, here's a man, Dr. Gleason Archer. He writes a good book. I have it in my library. You know, you'll get a lot of people that'll go ahead and say, well, this contradicts this, and this contradicts this. Well, Dr. Archer went through and created his own book called The Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties. And he goes through it and talks about the internal consistency of the Bible. Now, internally, the Bible is consistent from cover to cover. Now, where do we run into problems? Well, usually we run into problems because of this word being translated this way, and it doesn't for some reason fit. In fact, it can't. So the thing is, if we look at um, any book of the Bible, and we say, well, this is in error, and you're going to get people that will go ahead and name different books and different passages and say, well, this can't happen. Well, the thing is, are we looking at the original language? Or are we looking at somebody's translation? And if we're looking at a translation, we better be very, very careful. Sir? Kind of like the word uh, Easter, because it can be found in the Old Testament. Ah, thank you. So, Somebody have King James Version? Well, I was actually saying that if you took the word Easter out of the New Testament, which it happens to show up in, and you go back into the Old Testament and find the word Astarte, you'll get God's true opinion of what Easter really is. Exactly. You might want nothing to do with it. Oh, you want to... Um, it was in, and I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. If you have a King James Version, uh, anybody remember what chapter of Acts it is? It's in Acts, and it's actually translated as Easter. Now, you don't find it there in the um, complete Jewish Bible. I can't remember off the top of my head. If somebody reminds me during the week, I'll write it down and go and do a search. Uh, somebody, if you have a computer and you can go King James Version, look up the word Easter and then uh, let me know. Because that word Easter in the King James Version is not Easter. If you look at the Greek, it's Pascha. And Pascha comes from Passover. Not Easter. They didn't celebrate Easter except for the pagans didn't. I mean, they did. Go ahead and find that if you can. It's an axe, I guarantee you. Okay, moving on. Dr. Uh, Gleason Archer, he says this. As I have dealt with one apparent discrepancy after another and have studied the alleged contradictions between the biblical record and the evidence of the linguistics, archaeology, or science, my confidence in the trustworthiness of scripture has been repeatedly verified and strengthened by the discovery that almost every problem in scripture that has ever that typo, my typo, that has ever been discovered by man from ancient times until now has been dealt with in a completely satisfactory manner by the biblical text itself or else by objective archaeological information. Now this is a man who studied. Yes, sir. Acts 12, 4. Acts 12, verse 4. So if you happen to have a King James Version, go to Acts 12, 4, and you'll see that word Easter. By the way, how does God feel about it? Well, in Deuteronomy, amongst other places, the goddess is named Astarte, from which another culture says Ishtar, which is where Easter comes from. That's what the pagans celebrated. That's not what believers in the Most High God celebrate. Dr. Archer, thank you. Dr. Archer goes on to say, there is good and sufficient answer in scripture itself to refute every charge that has ever been leveled against it. 
But this is only to be expected from the kind of book the Bible asserts itself to be, the inscriptor of the infallible, inerrant word of the living God. Now, what's the qualifications of Dr. Gleason Archer, you may ask? Well, he was known around the seminary as the man who had learned over 30 languages. How many of you have done that? I don't. I can't. I've forgotten, as I confessed, I've forgotten more words in foreign languages than I could even remember anymore. <laughs> That's why I've forgotten them. Over 30 languages. If you are as qualified as Dr. Archer, then you should, if you have a problem with his book, you should refute him. Most of them, most of those languages were from the Old Testament times in the Middle Eastern world. Then he taught for over 30 years at the graduate seminary level in the field of biblical criticism. I think we may safely say that Dr. Gleason Archer is smarter than most of us in this room. Does he keep the Torah? Pardon? Does he keep the Torah? Do you know what? Probably not, because he's a Christian. But when it comes to biblical criticism and study of the word, by the words, if you have that same qualification, you can do the same thing whether you're following it or not. To be honest, I would say more than 90% of Christendom, even all the scholars and all the Bible college professors together, and I know quite a few, are keeping. So they're not as smart as they think they are. Okay, I'll Moving on. So if Dr. Archer doesn't have a problem with biblical text, we shouldn't either. Now we move on to the external. Do other historical materials confirm or deny the internal testimony provided by the documents themselves? How do you know, folks, that there was a Yeshua or Jesus? How do you know that? Do you just take the word of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Thessalonians, and all the rest of those New Testament books? Or can you find the existence of Yeshua, Jesus, someplace else in other people's writings? Yes, you may. You can actually find the proof of God or Yeshua by uh, historians. That's correct, but you're going to find it. I saw the James actually. It has been proven by a historian. See, back then the issue wasn't, was there Yeshua? The issue was, was he... Who he said he was. Who he said he was, the son of God, yeah. was the issue. So there are plenty of proof in history. Well, let me, get, let me get you one step a whole lot closer to the real event of Yeshua's existence. You only have to go to the Talmud which is about 300, 400 years after. So the reality is, is Yeshua talked about, but let's get even closer. Josephus Flavius wrote about him. That's very, very close. That's during the time of the first Jewish revolt. So we've got Josephus Flavius writing about the existence of Yeshua, which then boils down to exactly what you were talking about. Is Yeshua who he said he was? Now that's where we take our step of faith. You see what Abraham had to accept by faith? We have to accept in similar vein. The historians faith. even write that he was crucified with, uh, they bartered for his clothes exactly like the Bible. Correct. Yep. I mean, right down to their teeth. Exactly. And these are historians, and they're, uh, you know, they don't believe in the Bible. They're just writing yeah, history. they're just writing things. And did Josephus believe in Yeshua? Not by the evidence of even his own history. But the thing is, did he believe that Yeshua existed? Yeah. yeah. Did he believe that Yochanan, John the Baptizer, existed? You betcha he did. Yeah. He wrote about him, too. Yes, sir. He also said that he saw Lot's wife, too. That he what? Oh yeah, the remnant of Lot's wife was still in existence at the time of Josephus. Yep. It's a salt red residue since she was changed to salt. Yep. By the Dead Sea, by the way. So the thing is, we look at other materials to validate that what the Bible is saying is true, is really true. So it isn't just take the Bible, you know, they... The atheists sort of accuse us of uh, circular logic. We say the Bible is true. The Bible is the word of God. Well, where do you get that from? Well, because the Bible says it's the word of God. 
That's circular reasoning they accuse us of. Well, we need to break that cycle. We need to break that cycle by simply going ahead and saying there are other evidences that the Bible is the word of God. Assuming that Daniel did write about the interpretation, you know, that it would start with Babylon, then it would go to Medio Persia, then it would go to Greece, then it would go to another one. Assuming that those were written by Daniel, then it had to have been a miracle or a prophetic event by God giving this to Daniel before the event, hundreds of years before the event. So do we have other documents that can go ahead and support what we have in our Bibles? We have to look at that, and we have to see if it's true. So what other sources are there apart from that Bible or the books under analysis? that substantiate its accuracy, reliability, and authenticity. Well, here you could go to Papias. He was a bishop. He was a church uh, writer, AD 130. That's not too far away. Irenaeus, and I'm not saying I agree with all that these guys write. I've read them. Good book to get. If you want to get a good book, it's known as the Ante, A-N-T-I, or A-N-T-E, excuse me, Nicene Fathers. And you can read about these guys, and you can read about what they say. Anti means preceding. It precedes the Council of Nicaea. Yeah. So, Papias, 130. Irenaeus, 180. Clement of Rome, 95. Ignatius, 70 to 110. 70 is when the temple was destroyed. Polycarp, 70 to 156. And Titian, yeah, these are, yeah, that's where the problem started, right there. That's where the problem started, yep. Because these Take guys are not Jews. Take me back in time. These guys are not Jews, but they do still support, you know, as extra biblical support. Support what? <laughs> At least what the words of the. Syncretism. Well, yeah. Uh, and I agree with you. We've talked about this numerous times how the early church fathers went ahead and transformed and syncretized what was once a Hebraic faith into a Greek one, the early church fathers. There were several. Now, other who were not Christian writers outside of the Bible, Tacitus, which was a Roman historian, Suetonius, chief secretary to the Emperor Hadrian, and Josephus, which we just talked about, AD 70 to 100, he was a Jewish historian. You got Thallus, AD 52, Pliny the Younger, Roman author and administration, administrator, excuse me, the Emperor Trajan, the Talmud itself, Lucian, a second century Greek writer, and Mara ben Serapion. Uh, I don't remember where I got that. Now, moving on and running out of time. <laughs> the stones cry out. We need to pay attention to all these things. We must not put our emphasis on the early church fathers because of what they did. The church today, and I love, I love studying history. I love trying to understand how did we get to where we are today. If you go back to the book of Acts, and you go in the book of Acts to Acts chapter 21. I'll get there in a moment. Paul, or Shaul, after his third and final missionary journey, comes back to Jerusalem. And it says in verse 17 that in Jerusalem the brothers, the other disciples, apostles, received us warmly. The next day Shaul and the rest of us went into Yaakov, that's James, the brother of our Lord Yeshua, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, Shaul described in detail each of the things God had done among the Gentiles through his efforts. Important. Read verse 20. On hearing it, they praised God, but they also said to him, You see, brother, how many tens of thousands of believers... In the Greek, it's myriads. Myriad is a lot, a lot of people. That there are among the Judeans, that means the Jewish people, there were tens of thousands of believers in Yeshua amongst the Jews at that point in time. What we were seeing at that point of time is it's approximately 58 years A.D. 58 A.D. That's 28 years after the death and resurrection of our Lord Yeshua. And James goes on to say, and they are all zealous for the Torah. 
In other words, there were tens of thousands of Jewish believers in Jesus, as we use his name today, and they are all zealous for their Torah observant and Torah zealous. Now look at today, after 2,000 years. Most of the believers in the church today are not Jews. Secondly, most of the believers in the church today are anti-law because of Paul's writings. They say, but we're no longer under law, we're under grace. Well, that fails to take into account the text as to when it was written about what Paul was writing and who he was writing to and what the thought of that day was. And it fails to take into account all that. The thing is, the church today isn't the church of the first century. Now, I came from the illustrious state of Minnesota next to the Canadian border. In the state of Minnesota, in the northern part of Minnesota, there is a lake called Lake Itasca. And it forms because of a spring, and it formed Lake Itasca. Lake Itasca has an outlet, and it follows along a kind of a windy course all the way to its terminus. But Lake Itasca is the beginning of the Mississippi River. At Lake Itasca. Did you spit in it? No. At Lake Itasca, I could go to the spring that begins the Mississippi River, and I could freely drink the water coming immediately out of the ground. Now, some 60 miles as the crow flies, but longer as the Mississippi flows, I went to Bible College first in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I went down by the river. 60 miles of river, oh, big deal. There's still pure water, isn't there? You will get deathly sick if you drink the water in Minneapolis out of the Mississippi. Larry had the ability after Katrina to go down to Louisiana. Tell me about the Mississippi River just yeah. as it exits. You don't want to even talk about it. You would not drink of it. What was happening from Lake Itasca all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico and the Mississippi it was accumulating what? Pollution. Wow. Deathly sick pollution. I can drink of the water in Lake Itasca at the spring, but if I go all the way down to the end of the Mississippi, all that pollution in there will kill me. This is what has happened to the church between Acts chapter 21 and today. That's what's happened. You follow history through, you can see it. By the way, those early church non-Jewish fathers, they were bringing all this stuff coming in from what they wanted to have in there. Let me share with you, if you've got a minute, look at Leviticus chapter 23. The Feast of the Lord. The Feast of the Lord. Now we saw the, in the Bashamru today, we saw God said about the Shabbat that it was going to be just for that generation of Jews. <laughs> No. He said it was what? Forever. He said it was throughout your generations, and if all we have to do is look around, we got generations here. Look at this. The Sabbath day, the seventh day Shabbat. That's a appointed time of the Lord. Passover, verse five, that's an appointed time of the Lord. Unleavened bread, verse six, that's an appointed time of the Lord. First fruits. Verse 10, that's an appointed time of the Lord. Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, verse 16, that's an appointed time of the Lord. By the way, this one here on verse 21 says it's a permanent throughout all your generations observance. Yom Teruah, Day of Trumpets, that's an appointed time of the Lord. In verse number 24. Day of Atonement, 27, that's an appointed time of the Lord. Permanent throughout all your generations, just like the Seventh-day Sabbath. Feast of Sukkot, that's tabernacles. That's a permanent day of the Lord. Now what happened when these early church fathers came in? What did they come out of? Hello? What did these early church fathers, non-Jewish church fathers, come out of? Paganism. Paganism. What did they have within their church or their fellowship? Paganism. They had paganism. So 
Ishtar, the fertility goddess. They were Hellenistic. Hell. That's paganism. Saturnalia, the worship of the sun. Tammuz, the worship of the sun. Paganism. What did they feel comfortable about and bringing it into the church? Paganism. So whatever happened to all these feast days when these early church fathers took control? They removed everybody but one. Pentecost. Oh, yeah. You'll find the church today will still celebrate Pentecost. On what day, though? That's the question. So these early church fathers changed things from Acts 21 to the present day. All you have to do is study a little history and be willing to change if it steps on your toes. So when you bring paganism into the church, it becomes Hellenistic? It does. It does. And it becomes pagan. Syncretism. Syncretism is taking that which you, for instance, you're already familiar with, paganism, and then bringing the aspects of this other religion that you're merging with it in. You're bringing hell into it? I mean Hellenistic. Hellenistic, yeah. So moving on, I'm going to get off my sofa uh, box again. Moving on. We need to realize that archaeology, the stones, cry out to the accuracy of this book. We need to know that. Regardless of what has crept in, that book is still an accurate book, and that book is still the Word of God. And that book still speaks into our lives, or it better. Because you and I may very well end up putting our lives at risk by believing in this book. I'm going to have to move a little faster here. Nelson Gluck, a renowned Jewish archaeologist, wrote, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. So when you have men like Sir William Ramsey, who was a very strong skeptic because he went through the German historical school of the mid-19th century, he believed that the book of Acts was just a product of the middle second century AD. He was so convinced of that belief. But he had to make a topographical study of Asia Minor, and he was con compelled at that time, when he had to do that, to study the writings of the, of the book of Luke. Acts, that is. And here's what he said. I may fairly claim, excuse me, to have entered on this investigation without prejudice in favor of the conclusion which I shall now seek to justify to the reader. On the contrary, I began with a mind unfavorable to it, that is, Luke. It did not then lie in my line of life to investigate the subject minutely. But more recently, I found myself brought into contact with the book of Acts, as an authority for the topography, antiquities, and society of Asia Minor. In other words, if you're looking for some accuracy in sites that were mentioned in the Book of Acts, then here's a man who was a skeptic of the Book of Acts, now using the Book of Acts to find all this. It was gradually borne upon me that in various details the narrative showed Marvelous truth. In fact, beginning with a fixed idea that the work was essentially a second century composition and never relying on its evidence as trustworthy for the first century condition, I gradually came to find it a useful ally in some obscure and difficult investigations. Is this book a historical document? You betcha it is. Is it an archaeological document? Can you find sites because of this book? You betcha you can. We need to rely upon this book. We need to trust in this book and we need to realize that the book of Acts is accurate and can be relied upon. Almost done. How about the rest of the Bible? Well, Josh McDowell, the author of The New Evidence That Demands a Verdict, which I have in my bag, page 68, says this. After trying to shadow the historicity and validity of scripture, I came to the conclusion that it is historically trans trustworthy. If one discards the Bible as being unreliable, then one must discard almost all literature of antiquity. If the Bible is not accurate, well, then neither is Homer. 
Neither is Aristotle. None of those are accurate because you don't even have as many copies as you do of the New Testament. He goes on to say, one problem that I constantly face is the desire on the part of many to apply one standard or test to secular literature and another to the Bible. One must apply the same test whether the literature under investigation is secular or religious. Having done this, I believe we can hold the scriptures in our hands and say, the Bible is trustworthy and historically reliable. It's a book that we need to trust. So as with the Tanakh, because of the method of transmission, as with that, the accuracy is built in, even with the brief out of shot, due to the multi multitude of copies that were made when they received a copy, that they made copies of that, and by the plethora, the great number of copies that were made, we can go back and say that this text is accurate. Next about to put a hook in your mouth, Hopefully you'll be able to get you here. How do we know that the Bible is really the Word of God? And I'll be doing that teaching on uh, the conference next year for the UMJ conference, as opposed to other writings that purport, quote unquote, holy writings to be the Word of God. Oh, is the Quran, anybody? Is the Quran the holy Word of God? No. Why? Did you study it? It's not the Word of God. Yeah. How do you know? How do I know? Yeah. I, How do you know? It says it. It's probably the word of it. Hey, God. It shows hey God. I do believe it's a holy book, though. Oh, but then the Book of Mormon is. Is what? Joseph Smith said that the holy. Book of Mormon was translated by the Urim and the Thummim while he was looking through this hat at the gold plates. <laughs> It's the word of God, isn't it? Tell him to put the pipe down and leave alone. <laughs> Folks, how about the Bhagavad Gita? The Hindu. It's the word of God, isn't it? Wait a minute. Why aren't you guys shaking your head up and down? Why? Because you know it's not the word of God. And the basic rules are this. Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18. You've got to go right back to the author... And he tells you how you can know if a book or writing is coming from him or from a, another God.